For people unfamiliar with you, please just tell us your name, your background, and really what you've been doing for the last several years. Sure. Well, I'm Mark Cerez. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Geography in the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm also the director of something called the National Snow and Ice Data Center, a center of about 95 people doing all kinds of work on snow and ice. Uh, and uh, my own background, I uh, grew up in Maine, uh, got interested in climate science, uh, oh gee, back in my early 20s, and I've been doing it ever since then. What is your book about, Brave New Arctic, The Untold Story of the Melting North? Well, my new book, Brave New Arctic, it was a, a book that I really wanted to write for a long time, finally got the opportunity to do it. And it's a story about how the Arctic transformed from an Arctic of old that the explorers of the 19th century would have recognized to something that is becoming very different today. And it's a story really about science, scientists, and how science is done. How scientists from around the world came together to try and understand these changes. Um, so it's a, a lot of it is a personal history, my own history of trying to understand what was happening, but also bringing in the stories of uh, many, many scientists who I've worked with through the years. Uh, so it's really a story about scientists and scientists and how science is done. Can climate change be reversed? And if so, how? Well, certainly climate change could be reversed. Now, we have to remember that climate has changed all through Earth history. Um, it's changed on periods of, you know, maybe decades to centuries to periods of, you know, tens of millions of years. Uh, climate has always been changing. This recent climate change, though, has a different cause than climate changes of the past, and that's because we're adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere through fossil fuel burning. Can we stop this climate change? Absolutely. Stop burning fossil fuels. Now, it will take a while for the climate to get back to where it was because the problem is the carbon dioxide that you've got in the atmosphere today, it'll stay up there for a long time, really in the matter of centuries. So this wouldn't be immediate. Uh, but yeah, we could get things back to where they were. It really all depends on us. Specifically, can we remove greenhouse gases from the air? Removing greenhouse gases from the air, well, there's been a lot of research being done on that, what we call sequestration. In other words, um, if you're burning coal, for example, pull, pull the carbon dioxide out before it even has a chance to get to the atmosphere. Uh, there's a lot of work on this, different technologies, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that would have to occur on a massive scale. Um, I would think that our smarter option now is just to go to uh, better ways of producing energy uh, and let that carbon dioxide come out of the atmosphere you know, on its own. We can live with some warming. We already are. We can live with some warming. We're committed to that. The real challenge is making sure it doesn't get out of hand. Guy McPherson is very pessimistic about humans surviving even 10 more years on the planet. What do you think? Well, I think that's uh, rather pessimistic. Uh, we are a remarkably adaptable species. You know, humanity's been through a lot and we've survived. Um, we'll live in a warmer world if we have to. Well, we're already going to live in somewhat of a warmer world, even if we do, uh, you know, nothing right now. But uh, we are remarkably adaptive. Uh, and, uh, but it'll be a different world. Uh, we'll be leaving our children and grandchildren a different world, a world that is really not as robust, not as good. But we'll survive it, uh, so I'm not nearly that pessimistic. We are a remarkably adaptable species. How close are we to irreversible feedback loops that'll speed up climate change? Well, this, uh, you talk about these feedback loops. Some people call them tipping points. Uh, that's a, a word that you commonly hear. Uh, that you get to some certain point and then bang, things fall apart. Um, certainly the concept of tipping points or irreversible damage is, is certainly valid. Uh, but what I see in terms of climate change is that it's an overall warming with a lot of ups and downs because there's a lot of natural variability uh, in the system. And that's kind of the trajectory we'll go on. Um, I think uh, Probably the bigger danger, uh, from my point of view, in terms of what we call tipping points, is in ecosystems, for example. Uh, you deplete the oceans, you deplete the fisheries, microplastics in the oceans. These are the sorts of things that could cause something like an ecosystem collapse. I think those are the things we really have to be thinking about. How likely are we to experience food or water shortages due to climate change? Well, in terms of uh, 
some of these effects of climate change that are affecting people, food, water shortages, you're already seeing it uh, at some level. Uh, for example, the people who live in the Arctic are already dealing with climate change. It's a frontline thing uh, in terms of uh, losing the sea ice, which is changing their hunting practices. Um, so this is something that we're already seeing, and we'll probably see more of it. Uh, the general, uh, what we, we're looking at in terms of the projections, in terms of like rainfall changes, the rule of thumb is the areas that are dry are probably going to get drier. The areas that are wet are probably going to get wetter. Uh, so if you're living in an area which is already semi-arid or something like that, yeah, you're at risk. Even if there's no change in precipitation, the fact that it's warmer means that there's more evaporation, which means that there's more drying. Uh, so this is uh, very much uh, something of concern because this puts us at risk, not just us, but ecosystems, you know, entire ecosystems. Uh, but it's among the challenges we're going to be facing. Again, it goes back to the issue, I said, that we can live with some warming. We're going to have to live with some warming. Got to get a handle on it before it gets out of handle, out of, it get, before it gets too big. How long have you been studying climate change? How long have I been studying climate change? Well, really, in a formal way, I guess you'd say, oh, probably 22 years old I was back then. So that was 1982, so what, 30, uh, you do the math, okay? But it's been, it's been uh, quite a while. Um, I'd always been interested in weather and climate. I grew up in Maine, where we had real winters and I loved snow and ice. So I was always the one that was watching the weather and things like that. But it was uh, kind of in my senior year of college uh, that I really started to get interested in it. And it was right after I graduated that I got my first opportunity to travel up into the Arctic. And I stepped off that plane into the Arctic and looked around and said, my gosh, this is what I want to study. Do you live in Colorado now? I live in Colorado now. I grew up in the state of Maine, uh, in the Kennebunk Port, Maine, actually. Uh, and then I moved to Colorado in 1986 to get my doctorate. I never left. So I became a Westerner. How often do you get to the Arctic yourself? I've been getting there, oh, let me see, I've been up about, uh, for different expeditions, uh, about 15, 16 times. Uh, I haven't been for a couple of years, uh, and it's just the way schedules have worked out and things like that, but I will hopefully rectify that deficiency uh, in the next uh, year. And the way I see it in terms of, you know, I've got to get up there because uh, you've got to have street cred, right? You've got to hit it with your own hammer.